Hi there. This is Neil Satin, the host of Relationship Alive. The Relationship Alive podcast is my offering to you to support you in having the best possible relationship. So if you're finding it to be helpful, please consider a donation to help support the podcast. In order to do that, all you have to do is visit neilsatin.com slash support or text the word support to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And thank you so much for your help in ensuring that we can continue. And today's show is also sponsored in part by Talkspace, the online therapy company that lets you choose from over 1,500 licensed therapists. Get matched with your perfect therapist who can put you on the path to a happier life and a thriving relationship. For a special offer for you, visit Talkspace.com slash alive. Also, many of the things that we're going to talk about in this episode require a lot of really great communication between you and your partner. If you're interested in learning how to communicate in relationships so that no matter what you're talking about, the good things or the challenging things, you can become more connected with your partner, then please consider downloading my free guide to my top three relationship communication secrets. To do that, all you have to do is visit neilsatin.com slash relate, or you can text the word relate to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. Okay, I think that's everything. Let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. On this show, over and over again, we've been talking about the topic of conscious relationship. What does it mean to evolve your relationship to someplace new, someplace different? How do you recognize the patterns that are just about unhealthy relating, things that you've inherited from, your, from the culture, from your parents, from your friends, from, uh, so, from your karma? And how do you identify those things and get to a place where you can move past them into uncharted territory that's about coming together clearly with your partner and uh, helping each other heal, grow, um, and have a mission in the world that's maybe something you do together or maybe supporting each other in your separate missions. But in the end, wanting both you and your partner to shine more brightly in the world and to do that in a way that enhances your connection as opposed to growing you apart. On today's show, we are having a very special guest, Jeff Brown, who is the author of An Uncommon Bond, which is a novel about conscious relationship. He's also the author of Soul Shaping, and he is followed by thousands and thousands of people on Facebook and elsewhere who tune in to the way that he writes and how it evokes um, new insight, new states of consciousness. And uh, it's a real pleasure to have him here with us today to talk about his book, to talk about conscious relationship, and to talk about soul shaping and how we can craft our growth and development in a way that's generative for you, and for the world around you as well. So thank you, Jeff Brown, for being here on Relationship Alive with us today. My pleasure, Neil. I'm, uh, I'm also quite grateful for this amazing work you're doing in the world, trying to raise awareness of conscious relationship and really deepen into the dialogue. I think it's, it's, such, it's such an important step forward for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, it's something I'm incredibly passionate about, and it's always a pleasure to have to be able to sit down with someone like you who also is equally passionate about thinking about where we're going um, along with where we've been. So maybe we could start by just, uh, you know, I've already mentioned your books. Um, and oh, by the way, if we are going to have a show guide for this episode, so if you're interested in downloading that, you can visit neilsatin.com slash soul shaping. 
Um, or you can text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions and we'll get that show guide to you. Um, so let's maybe just start with what is what is soul shaping since that is at the core of your work. Shaping was really, I mean, I, I, when I had begun to write that, my first book, I, I was just trying to make sense of my own experience. And what ultimately made sense to me at that time was that um, as I look back on my life, it seemed that I had, you know, uh, some internalized what James Hillman called the innate image or what I came have come to call soul scriptures, that I had some encoded sacred purpose that included, you know, key uh, relational figures, um, particular callings to certain work in the world, certain archetypal transformations that I was here to go through, um, as though I was somehow shaping my soul towards wholeness. Um, and, you know, as I looked at every stage of my life, there were, I mean, there were a lot of seemingly insignificant experiences and moments, but there were these very fundamentally um, relevant and significant moments uh, externally sourced, but also often coming from within that seemed to be pointing me in the direction of a particular encoded path that I was here to walk in order to move in the direction of a more inclusive and whole centered consciousness. Hmm. And so part of your work, I know you do uh, soul shaping sessions with people as well. So you're, you're writing about it and then you're also helping people discover that path for themselves. Uh, I am. And, you know, I, 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 but I define it very broadly. I think what shifted for me when I began is I was really focused on callings, you know, the calling to write soul shaping your work in the world right now, you know, Oprah Winfrey's work to bring that message, whatever that message is or was to the world. And, and what I've come to believe and understand and so much of my session work is focused on is really dealing with the unresolved emotional material. Because for me, I grew most in my spirituality through the evolution of my spiritual process, of my emotional processes. For me, emotional maturation and spiritual maturation are synonymous. I don't distinguish the two. That's why I'm so deeply opposed to split off or dissociative views of spirituality, um, ideas of enlightenment that exist independent of the emotional body, the unresolved ego, the story that has yet to be processed. Because for me, this is where most of the transformation happened. At the end of a deep or profound emotional process, I found that I was able to hold the space for the everything in a much more inclusive way. So soul shaping for me now is really about more than callings and archetypes. It's really, really about getting into that material that we hold individually and that we bring forward from the unresolved collective and doing the work that allows us to transform our individual and collective consciousness so that we can move individually and collectively in the direction of a more inclusive or whole centered consciousness. And I, that's one thing that I really appreciated in reading An Uncommon Bond, and, and I think you even mention it in your own notes at the end, this um, need to bring spirit into your embodiment. And so much of what, uh, what I talk about and what my partner Chloe and I work on in the world is, is allowing your body to be included in that experience, um, not in a way that is... Um, dissociating from your body, but where your your somatic experience is actually intrinsic and gives you such a such a, a wealth of information about what's happening with you on those more subtle levels. Um, so I like how you did that in in your book and emphasize that. Well, I don't even understand how one has any experience of anything independent of the body. Um, I mean, I think that all of that is just n nonsensical for me. I mean, if I look back at the experience that inspired an uncommon bond, that profound opening, all of it happened through uh, my somatic structure. Um, I mean, I felt as though I felt as though I entered and opened and we opened together into some kind of a portal of experience that seemed to transcend my embodied experience. But um, I'm not so sure that's true. I wasn't trained in the art of ecstasy. So when ecstasy came my way, I didn't know how to hold it or contain it somatically and somehow imagined it was happening independent of my body. But in fact, every single piece of that experience was happening through the body and the selfhood that was the container for the experience. And I'm not so sure that we're going to get anywhere 
particularly if we're trying to break through the patterns that obstruct our ability to actualize love between ourselves and others if we don't go deep back into the somatic structure and work the selfhood and work the story and work what's held in the cellular structure uh, in order to transform it in the direction of being able to be more open and available and sustaining of love when it arises. Yeah, I think for us, one thing that's been so profoundly trans transformative has been what happens in the quietness that when Chloe and I are together, and I'm just speaking from my experience here, in the quietness and paying attention to what what arises, what its sensations arise, and even just speaking to those, like without labeling them, but just saying like, oh, this is where I'm experiencing some tension right now, or I'm feeling this heat in this part of my body, those sorts of things end up becoming, uh, the word that's popping into my head is transportational, like they're... <laughs> Right. They bring us somewhere to different levels of experience that wouldn't happen if you were focusing on, you know, the kind of intimacy that's just about kind of getting each other excited and getting each other off. Right. Right. Beautiful. So I'm curious for you, um, the title of your novel is An Uncommon Bond, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about what that even means to have an uncommon bond. I think we should may have to rely on definition. It's a little bit lengthy, but uh, maybe the first part of it. I mean, when I I had an experience in '98, and I had no words for this experience, but this experience changed my life. And um, and I was doing a master's at Saybrook. Um, I was doing sorry, I was at Saybrook University in uh, San Francisco doing a humanistic psych degree, a master's, and. It just so happened that right at the seeming end of that connection, um, Jeannie Gene, October, who had written about uncommon bonds and had co-defined the term, uh, I believe, with, um, with Donald Rothberg, uh, was doing an uncommon bond weekend. Um, and so, and I, I mean, I, I was oblivious. I had no language for this profound experience. Um, and I was in a really profoundly confused place. And walked in that room and suddenly felt like somebody understood what my experience was. And so let me just read the first paragraph maybe of the definition. That would be great. Yeah. Um, uncommon bonds are love connections that are sourced in the transcendent and transpersonal realms. The couple feels destined to have met their connection is sourced in grace. This often leads to an experience of parapsychological or paranormal events, such as synchronicity, solendipities and non-local communications that defy known laws of time and space. There's a knowing of pure recognition of the other, a feeling of being cut from the same cloth, a sense of having occupied the same body in a previous life, or perhaps one soul residing in two bodies. The lovers experience a prayer of gratitude and a sigh of relief as though coming home after decades of wandering. A transpersonal energy dances within and between the couple. Spiritual practice is important to them since the relationship is often experienced as the premier spiritual engagement, an outgrowth of a relationship with the absolute. Um, and then it goes on to say that the, po the relationship polishes the rough diamond of the soul. For, some, for this reason, the relationship is sometimes dark, arduous, complex, accompanied by many dark nights of the soul. Um, and at the same time, there's a sense that the soul work could not happen in any other way than through the relationship. Repeated dancing back and forth, now self, now disappearing, wave to particle and back, characterizes the growing, changing, polishing, and refining process. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's the profound crack open in the presence of another who feels destined to have walked your way in this lifetime, feels deeply familiar. Uh, even if you don't believe in past lives, you have this experience and you're certain that they existed. Um, and at the same time, at this stage of human development, because of where we're at in terms of understanding the shadow, um, they are remarkably difficult to sustain. And particularly if one or both people in the in the dynamic are not egoically strong enough to hold to their center in the merging. Uh, usually, the um, the studies indicate genie studies that usually they end up breaking up unless they encounter each other or re-encounter one another at a at a much older age. Interesting. Um, it's just yeah. too much to hold. It's yeah, just too much to hold. Yeah, yeah, and. And I think because, and, and this is why these kind of connections can sometimes just knock you on your ass, is like it, it can 
um, it takes you to that place where you have to recognize at some level your dysfunction as well as those like transcendent states of, oh my God, like I, I just met the most amazing person and they're, you know, I, it, fe- it has all those feelings of reconnecting on a deep mystical level. And, and, and that's part of the problem, you know, and, and, and what you said earlier was true. They knock you down to your ass. They, so, you know, basically they pull you up and out. Um, and that may just be because we just don't know how yet to orient that experience or to have that experience in a way that's integrated with our humanness. Right. And that's, we don't have that training. Um, and I just don't know if we're at that stage developmentally where we can hold all of that at one time. That's the work. That's the work of conscious relationship to be able to bring together the trans something called a transcendent. If in fact there is any way to transcend and the imminent. Um, and in my experience, that's exactly what happened. It was a transportive experience uh, or what you call a transportational experience. <laughs> but, but the opening into the light, the light was so powerful and profound. It could not help but reveal the shadow. And of course, not only our shadow, we were walking into the collective shadow in that experience. Um, And because you can't have one without the other, you can't have a spirituality that only allows you to have ecstatic experience without also having the portal open to the shadow, the emergence of the shadow. And so we entered into both of those places. And then it just simply becomes a question of whether we're equipped, whether we're supported, whether we're capable and how toxic is our unresolved emotional material. Because if it's too toxic, um, if there's too much in the way of an abandonment wound or a jealousy wound or a betrayal wound or whatever it is that you're carrying, it becomes almost impossible to sustain it um, because the, it just becomes too painful. Jeff, I hope you don't mind. I just need to pause a moment to give credit to this episode's generous sponsors. So you may or may not know that I recently got married and Chloe, my wife and I were looking for a great way to create a wedding registry. Now there is something about the typical way of going about this that didn't appeal to us. For one thing, we were looking for ways to pull all of our eclectic tastes and ideas together in one place. And more than getting stuff, we were hoping that our guests would contribute to a honeymoon fund so that we could travel someplace exotic and have an amazing time and amazing experiences. So we used Zola.com to create our registry. And now, not only are they sponsoring this episode, but they're offering $50 credit toward your registry if you visit Zola.com slash alive. It's a free service, was easy to use both for us and our guests, and it made creating our custom registry fun. And basically, it allows you to pull together gifts from all over the web with over 500 brands, more than 50,000 gifts and experiences to choose from, or your guests can simply contribute cash that you can use however you want. They also have a group gifting feature that lets your guests pool together towards big ticket gifts like airfare. They offer price matching and free shipping every day. So overall for us, using Zola was a really positive experience. And again, to sign up with Zola and join over 300,000 couples, including me and Chloe, who have used them, and to receive $50 credit towards your registry, visit Zola.com slash alive, as in relationship alive. That's Z-O-L-A dot com slash alive. And thank you, Zola, for helping make this podcast possible. And obviously, if you're not getting married, but you know someone who is, make sure you forward this link along to them so they can get that $50 credit. Now, also, if you listen to my last episode on how to turn projection into something useful, then you also know that I've been creating an even broader web of support for myself with this episode's other sponsor, Talkspace.com. They also have an offer for you of $30 off your first month by visiting Talkspace.com slash alive and using the coupon code alive. Using Talkspace, you can send your therapist texts, audio, and video messages anytime you want, or you can even do a live video chat. I've just been using the texting feature, and they make it easy to connect with an experienced, licensed therapist that you can pick based on your preferences for a fraction of the price of traditional therapy. 
Talkspace therapists are fully licensed and go through a rigorous screening process, in addition to thousands of hours of supervised professional training. So to match with your perfect therapist, you can go to Talkspace.com slash alive. And as I mentioned, they have a special offer for you. If you use the coupon code alive, you'll get $30 off your first month and be able to show your support for the Relationship Alive podcast. That's Talkspace.com slash alive and the code alive. And thank you Talkspace as well for sponsoring today's episode. So now back to our conversation. Now, we spoke a little bit before the, the interview officially started, and, and I come down pretty strongly on the level of not, not, do, um, not that everyone has to stay together. Like if you, if you find someone and you fall in love that somehow you're like, you have to be together for the rest of your lives. That, that's not where I am. However, I do feel like there's, there's a journey of skill building and opening and healing that could actually bring most people to this transcendent place. That's just my belief. And, uh, yeah. and I'm curious to know where, where you come down on that in terms of like, do all connections have the potential to be uncommon bonds versus right. not? Yeah. I'm writing about this on an individual level in my current book. So you know, it's, it's, it is very similar to what people are doing individually. They're trying to pull up and out of the humanness in order to have some kind of an ecstatic or inclusive or unity consciousness experience. And then they find it's unsustainable when they try to come back into the world and they have to integrate with the world and they have to confront their material, the unresolved material that they're actually carrying in their body. So, um, I think that, the problem is this. If I think of dynamics I've had that started really on a ground or pragmatic level, um, that didn't have that element of pull up and out, that didn't have what we might call a mystical aspect, um, usually there's not enough charge in the connection to want to go through that process or to believe that you're going to land at a place where you're going to be have an expansive experience together. So usually it starts with something that pulls you up and out that feels like there's some profound joy potentially waiting for you if you can do some work along the path. Um, but what I do believe and what does make sense to me is that something happens in the earthbound work, the relational work, the, the work that you're doing in your partnership, I'm sure, around the unresolved material that emerges, the, the social anxiety, the discomfort, all the levels of triggering that are happening in dynamics that have some charge to them, that if you can see that process through, and I don't think a lot of people have, we don't have a lot of love elders to talk to about this yet, Neil, but I think that they do, that I have a feeling that they do integrate back into an experience of that ecstatic union in a way that feels more real to me, more sustainable for sure, and may have a remarkably different aspect, uh, remarkably different tenor or resonance than the experience, for example, that I had in the initiating uncommon bond experience. I'm stuck with this. I'm not exactly sure um, which way to go with. I can't really fully answer your question because I'm I'm still trying to figure that out in myself. Um, but I do know for sure that if you don't come back and do the earthbound work and you don't weave all the threads together within you and break through all of the obstructions within you, that for sure the experience that you're having is unsustainable. Can we get really practical for a moment and, yeah. and talk about what that process of um, resolving could look like for someone and maybe even like what's a what's a step or two that someone could take after they listen to this episode of the podcast that would that would help them move along that journey okay so let's say you've met somebody and you've had this awakening we'll call it an awakening experience with them and you feel like you've entered into some portal that feels beautiful delicious and at the same time feels vulnerable and terrifying or something um, then I think probably what you would begin to do if you wanted to sustain it and deepen it and grow through it without knowing necessarily if this is someone who will be with you for life, you don't know that really yet, um, is you would begin to work and probably somatically um, to uncover 
all of the levels of material that are getting in the way. So for example, if you find yourself in that opening suddenly feeling super triggered by the fact that this other person is presumably looking at other women, for example, um, and they may feel like they're just looking at them as they pass by them on the street, but a jealousy trigger might arise because now you have so very much to lose because your heart is so deeply opened. Um, you have two choices. You either continue to sustain the reactivity that comes up rising in the trigger, or you decide you're going to work on your historical material. Past life aside, working on that, I don't know so much about that, but working um, somatically with a somatic-based psychotherapist, maybe a bioenergetic or core energetic or somatic experiencing therapist, to really go deep into the caverns in the body to find out where that material is sourced, um, where, what, where it comes from, and to try to work your way through to a more healed or transformed experience around it. So that when you re-engage in the connection and your partner happens to look at a woman walking down the street, you're not so triggered that you're going to obstruct the development of the connection. Mm. Yeah, so there's so much there in terms of being able to recognize that you have a trigger even happening and right. and going through some sort of process to to resolve um, whatever is stuck there that's causing the trigger. Right. And, and, you know, with a jealousy trigger, it could be that there's some, like there's something there, there's some reason that your, that your safety radar is, is activated. And that would be something to address in your, in your coupleship. Um, and to determine whether or not it's based in reality or whether it's based in your holdings. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, the, the way I think of it more broadly um, is that, you know, if I think of my grandparents or my parents, they were organized relationally around a survivalist construct. They defined who they were by what put, put, put food on the table and whatever roles or duties had been culturally conditioned into them and, and the way that the system held that. Um, now we're at the very beginning of this bridge crossing. Um, and as a result of that, moving in the direction of authenticity as our orienting principle, that is, we relate on the basis of who we really are, not on some basis of some role, duty, adaptation, disguise, or mask that allows us to get through a survivalist world, we're opening the door to a whole range of material that has really never been attended to by mostly anybody in historical terms, certainly not in our family lineage, at least not most of us. So. This is the hardest time for everybody because it means if you're going to go on what we're calling a conscious relationship journey, which for me is an authentic relationship journey, um, you're you're going to confront a gigantic tsunami of unresolved material that you're holding and that's deep within the collective. You need to be brave. You need to be patient. You need to be incredibly realistic, and a lot of people are not realistic. They're dealing with fire. They don't understand what that really means. It means it's going to go on for years and years and probably always be part of your interface because we're the first path travelers crossing the bridge towards an authentic connection, and we're carrying an enormous amount of baggage with us. Yeah, I'm, I'm just – I'm kind of letting your words wash over me um, because – I th and I'm thinking about how um, our parents and grandparents, because they were oriented around survival, then that was an orienting principle that allowed them to brush things under the rug or to live in right. pain without resolving it. They had um, a system. They had a system and a number of premises and beliefs that just allowed that to happen. You know, don't look back, you know. I mean, there was, there's a million cliches that relate to that experience. They didn't expect anything different. They had no idea that anything else could even exist in that world. And probably it wouldn't have been congruent with the way the world was organized. It's still really not. You know, it takes a lot of time that we don't have to do this deeper work. And my concern is that people get an unrealistic vision of possibility um, for how quickly they're going to get there. I think that we need to understand we are doing the work of generations. We need to not be so damn hard on ourselves when we can't quite work a piece out. We need to allow ourselves to just step back and celebrate our little tiny victories because in collective terms, they're humongous and not hold to some vision of possibility that's not sustainable or possible sociologically in one lifetime. 
That's not to be discouraged us from doing the work. It's beautiful. <laughs> work. It's beautiful work. But let's also be realistic. About yeah, I was like, and right. yet we're going to try. Um, and there's absolutely, absolutely. And, and there's some tension in there too because the the temptation would be to now that you're not orienting around survival necessarily, but you still have to maintain. So you still have to somehow survive. We're wow, still in a survivalist are... world, Neil. We still have to adapt and mask and make a living. And, and the whole culture economically is built around masking and branding and putting on a show and putting away your feelings and not throwing tantrums in the marketplace and all that stuff. It's mostly inauthentic. So that's hard stuff. And then you got to come back home to it and want to reconnect to the subtle realms. You know, you want to do conscious armoring. You want to reach a stage where you go into the marketplace, you put on the armor you have to, but you're conscious enough to know to come home and take it off. Not always that easy to take it off if you're trying to make a living and striving and grinding it out in the marketplace. And, you know, sometimes I know couples that get into this place where they're so impatient with each other because the partner comes home and they're saturated in the energy of the marketplace. Well, that's because we're just at the beginning of authenticity as a way of being and our social structures and economic structures aren't even built around any of this yet. Right. So we have to be realistic. Let, let me just say my experience, my initiating on common bond experience taught me two things, two amazing things in all of that suffering and all that ecstasy. One is the possibilities that exist between two humans in my view, are so much more profound. I mean, all this work that's been done around, you know, Wilbur sketching models of, of consciousness with men sitting in meditation caves, go, you know, I'm not interested in any of that. To me, that is just patriarchal spirituality. It's safer, it's easier, I know why they focus there, but to me, it's the tiniest fragment of possibility compared to what's possible between two hearts. Because my experience was not only did we open to another portal, I felt as though there was a way in which if we could have kept going, we could have actually co-created some aspect of this universe with love as the transformative device for that. It is, we are, we're singing about love, not knowing what the hell we're talking about, but we're moving in the right direction. I mean, there's a reason why we're here and we feel love for one another. It is the direction to go. We're not just here together to show, to keep each other company. We're here together to show each other God. So, the other thing I learned is how far we are from being able to sustain and deepen into that experience because of the stage we're at in the collective, because the shadow is everywhere. Everyone is a trauma survivor if we compare their uh, human experience to the realm of the most subtle, humane, vulnerable, heart open possibility. So we're going in the right direction. We got a, a real super long way to go. And then we just have to decide if it's worth the energy that it's going to take to get us some, some part of the way there. Mm. Yeah, I think it's worth it. I totally think it's worth you it. You do. Yeah, well, that's why you're doing this podcast. <laughs> and I think it's worth it. And I also understand why some people who are carrying too much stuff or have too many practical challenges or have don't have enough relational support because there is very little relational support out there for this kind of work. Uh, I can understand why they say, fuck it, it's not worth it. I'm just going to have a more practical connection and put my energy somewhere else because the relational field is so challenging. It's all most people can do to manage and identify their own material. To put that two people in a room trying to do that and then weave the dynamic piece together and what comes up in the dynamic, it's extraordinary, hard, brave, profound, terrifying work. Something that I think is ironic, because I'm just, I'm pondering like, well, why, like, how did we even end up here in like conscious relationship land? And and I think that the, the irony, at least as I'm seeing it right now, is that it's the the cultural idea that you can meet someone and they can be your your hero you know you can have that love that lasts forever that engages you in like the practical question of like well how is that really possible and especially if you're not willing to settle for like well you know my grandparents were together forever but you know they never had a kind word to say about each other or that sort of thing um or frequently had an unkind word to say. <laughs> Let's just say it that way. Um, so, so it's diving into that question around what gets you to the long term that I think takes you out of the the common way of experiencing relationship, 
which we center around like how much how much dopamine we get from it, how much exhilaration we feel, how how romanced we are. And and it moves us because that in and of itself prob- isn't sustainable. It's sustainable when you merge that with the kind of healing work that you're talking about that takes energy and attention and intention because it doesn't just happen on its own. Right. I didn't mean to monologue there. <laughs> no, it's not, no, it's no problem. I, I didn't want to respond. I think what you said was absolutely true. So it gets me wondering then if that's true from your perspective, how would a partner bring attention to this to like, if you're in a relationship and you're caught in, you know, like the first part of your book an uncommon bond, I was, I was frustrated. It was almost like how, because it's portraying, you know, this aspect of relationship. And it, to me, it almost felt like how there are all these songs on the radio that I can't even listen to anymore that used to be like themes for my life. But like now I just like, I hear it and it just, I'm kind of like, oh, like, I don't want to listen to that. And um, so there's this question, if you're like, if you know you're in that dynamic What's what's a pathway, what's a step in the right direction, especially Sorry. how do you bring that to your partnership? Sorry, define that dynamic? So if you recognize like, oh, I'm just like, we're just all over the map and we're getting triggered left and right. And what we need to do is actually come to a recognition that what's required is attention and intention on our healing journey as well as our... Um, romantic journey. Um, how do I bring that to to a partner? Um, well, it depends on the partner. Um, probably gently at first, but at some point, probably very directly. Um, I mean, there there really isn't a choice. You know, if if I mean, if you're not going to fall back to a survivalist framework. For dynamic, see, I, you know, conscious. The term conscious relationship doesn't work for me because consciousness is so bloody relative, you know, um, and it implies everybody before was unconscious and like we're conscious. And I mean, compared to where we're going to be in three hundred years, we're also unconscious. So, I think of it as just getting authentic, an authentic form of relatedness. And, you know, I think that every couple decides how far they're going to go in the direction of authenticity, of getting real with who they are and what lives below the surface and all the stuff that they see flying around in the dynamic and taking it seriously and understanding that it's real, not looking at it through the lens of, you know, ungrounded spirituality, which pretends that everything about the personality is unreal, but the ecstatic experience is real. Well, that's just ungrounded and nonsensical and not moving in the direction of pragmatism where you decide to just accept that's just the bullshit of life and you're going to keep yelling and screaming and abuse each other and keep moving forward. But every couple has to decide that. They have to have the conversation. Somebody has to have the conversation. And we've all been part of that. I've been part of that conversation when I absolutely and utterly refused to do the work. And I've been part of the conversation in the experience that initiated bond or that inspired uncommon bond uh, with somebody who absolutely refused to do the work. We had both experiences. And um, at some point, you just have to decide. You're either going to break up, you're going to embrace survivalism as a way of being, or you're going to move in the direction of a more awakening um, and authentic connection. And um, I mean, just initiate the conversation as gently as possible. It will often end, end up being a, a shouting match because somebody very often, this was the experience with the Uncommon Bond studies, one partner wanted to really go forward and deepen into the shadow work and the other one absolutely and utterly refused to. It's rare to find two people who in a dynamic that has supercharged and brings up the light and the shadow in really intense ways where both people are absolutely and utterly willing to do the work on the deepest, deepest levels. It's I've encountered very few couples like that in my life. Mm, yeah, it's something where I certainly feel blessed when I when I realized that with my partnership. You, if you got that, you're blessed, but it also means that you're, you're going to have a, in some ways a very hard path, you know, a beautifully fulfilling path. If you guys can see the process all the way through and not stop halfway. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are moments where it's really hard. Um, and, and then there are moments where it's really beautiful 
And you're doing the work for my booby and Zeta. You're doing, of course it's hard. You're doing the work for everybody, really, yeah. who's, who's never been able to do that work or even be aware of the existence of that work. It's, it's, it's really amazingly remarkable. Couples who do this work really need to just go out and have congratulatory dates and just give themselves a break when they can't quite get it right just because they're doing the work for everybody. And there's, there's something that's coming to me too around how the container of your relationship is so important to, and that, and establishing that container is often like one of the most challenging initial parts, I think of, of a couple embracing this kind of journey together is, um, you know, creating the safety that allows them to do that. So that, you know, when I look at my own experience, the things that are hard now are still hard, but they're not hard in a way where I feel like everything is just going to potentially fall apart like I did in those initial hard moments. Um, because your container is solid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but it took a lot of work to get there to the solid container. And, and what would you define as the key elements of that container? Uh, key elements of the container. One, um, well, there are the prerequisites to the container. Um, so first is developing your presence. And by that, I mean an embodied presence. Um, although I think, you know, there are times when a, when a more dissociative mindfulness can be helpful, particularly when you feel your trigger coming up and you're right there with your partner. But, um, but for the most part, it's the kind of presence that is about really being solidly in your body and, and knowing like what is coming up when you're with your partner. So that's prerequisite number one. And number two is establishing your communication, the kind of communication that's based on presence and that already has a backdrop of establishing safety. So you're, so you're shifting your communication paradigm where you recognize, okay, how we talk to each other about whatever is coming up for us. Like our mission is to keep each other safe in that conversation. Not that we avoid things to keep each other safe, but we, we bring things up in the context of safety. And if you get knocked off the rails, you figure out how to get back, back in, in line. Got it. So it can, um, be it can be uncomfortable, but not hurtful. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Or if you if you slip and you're hurtful, you're like, whoa, you know, I fucked up. Sorry. <laughs> like, you know, willingness to to bring that into your your awareness of how you communicate. So the capacity for self reflection is very important in this process. Exactly. Okay. Um, those two things, um, along with a whole bunch of curiosity. I think get you to a place where you can start looking at the container and that's both in terms of how you close your exits. So that means even seeing what your exits are in your relationship, the way that you put energy elsewhere or leave the leave the especially in the hard moments. And then on the flip side of container, it's like imbuing it with the beauty of your vision and what you want and what you crave and what you what you hope to embody together or what you want to amplify that you already have. Um, it's a combination of those two things that I think get you to a place where now you can dive into harder work and that structure holds you. And, and what do you, what do you feel? Uh, I know I'm turning this around and becoming the podcast <laughs> question, but, I'm, but you have a wealth of experience. And um, so how do you feel about the whole question of boundaries in terms of creating a safe container? around monogamy versus polyamory. Can this work happen if one or both parties is engaged in a polyamorous lifestyle? Mm, that's a great question. I think that it really depends on the couple. I have friends who are happily polyamorous, um, and I've had some clients who are happily polyamorous, um, but happily polyamorous also includes always being, or I shouldn't say always, but very frequently being stimulated uh, in the way that your partner being with someone else brings up your abandonment trauma or your um, need to be acknowledged or seen or, um, you know, there are all kind of ways that that can still tap into your 
um, into your deep primal issues around safety. The question in the couple is, are you in agreement around it? Um, and can you, if you're in agreement around what you're doing, then you can say, you can have conversations that either restore your safety because something did jeopardize it in terms of being polyamorous, or, um, or you recognize like, oh, what I'm experiencing right now actually isn't about my partner at all. It's this deep issue that, that I've held within me that has no relationship to my partner, except that they're stimulating it right now. And I'm going to deal with that. Um, that being said, for myself and for, I think, a lot of people, um, the path of monogamy focuses energy in a way that that I think is just, it's different. It, like, And I'm coming from a place, too, where I have two young kids and... Honestly, I can't imagine like having the time to deal with all like all of that. Like I'm going to do this conscious relationship thing, but with more people, you know, like in, in the mix, it seems on a practical level, really challenging um, and opening up to challenges like all the challenges around. Um, and you, you brought up the word boundaries, so maybe we revisit that in a moment. Um, but I think it introduces a set of challenges that create amazing growth, but that is not the growth that I personally choose. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I think it really depends uh, on on where you where you're wanting to go, and I think if you're wanting to go to the place of trying to explore and possibly develop the capacity to sustain the most profoundly inclusive kind of love experience one that opens the portal to the everything, one that explores the portal to the everything, um, that it cannot happen in a polyamorous union. What, what I think they're exploring is more uh, preliminary stage work, which for many of us is absolutely and utterly necessary. But I think because of the collective carry forward in terms of abandonment, betrayal, and jealousy material, that you absolutely have to have a monogamous container if you're wanting to go all the way. Uh, whether that'll be true in a thousand years, once we clear some of this debris, I don't know, although I suspect it will be. I feel like what's happening in the poly community is, um, apart from the whole self-avoidant aspect of that for many of them, which is shrouded in all kinds of spiritual fancy talk, um, I just think they're not they're not going to the same place because I don't believe humans can hold that portal open, that most profound, deeply vulnerable portal open unless there's a monogamous container. I think there's also a, a biological shift that is part of evolving a monogamous relationship. Um, the, the way that the, the dopamine pathways in your body start to change, um, where polyamory could potentially be like counterproductive to that, um, you know, because, well, I, here's where I come at it from. Um, there are a lot of clients that I work with where their relationship has grown stale and what they long for, they think, is like the rush of how it felt to meet and to be romanced and to, to have that huge sexual charge that I would say most people, not all, but most people do experience in the beginning of relationship when they connect with someone. Um, and they long for that and it's not there. And the challenge that I think, and, and so those people often come to me and say like, do you think we should open up our marriage so that we can get some more of that spark happening? No, they should enreal themselves and enreal their dynamic and go deeper and clear the debris so that when they connect sexually, they're actually present in a way that they never were able to be in the beginning. Yeah, so let's go there. Talk about enrealment. That's my bias, right? I and mean, I'm just writing a chapter about it in my new book. and. Yeah, I just think that, you know, it's it's very easy to go to staleness and then go to spark, staleness, spark, staleness, spark. It's a life, right? It's a way of life. But, you know, they, they need to at least have one experience in their lifetime of trying to go deeper into the shadow material together. 
clear the debris and develop a container or capacity and experience of intimacy that's quite a bit different than the one that happens in the beginning when you don't really know one another. You know, you don't know one another's shadow. You know, for whatever reason, we're transported to a place where we bypass that or crack through that or avoid that, whatever we're doing. But I think to move to the next place where you're actually deeply seeing of the other on every level and if you're doing the work together, loving them devotionally, beautifully, because you have so much regard for the courage that they bring to the moment to moment experience of the connection doing that work. I think that the intimacy just starts to flow from, from a completely different place. But because there was no space to do that work and there's no models modeling for doing that work and there are no love elders out there who can really support us in doing that work. We're at the beginning of that journey. It's easy to understand why they go back to spark because something's alive because the other spark, the spark I'm describing is the more sustainable, depthful, integrated, embodied, woven spark that travels through us on every level. And to get there, as you know, you have to do all the individual work to be able to be integrated and woven as between mind and body and all your aspects as an individual. It's so much work to get to that stage. You understand where they run away and go to spark again. But I think now we're having this conversation because we're at the beginning of trying to lay down the framework for how we go back to a different kind of spark while staying inside of the same union. And, um, Beautiful, yeah, but. there there's a reason we're having this conversation and yeah there's a reason you're listening to this conversation and i invite you if if you're listening and you're you're poly um from my perspective i'm in no way gonna say like oh you can't experience um transcendent conscious polyamorous relationship i just invite you to examine the dynamics that are at work and see you, if that's right. what's happening or not well, you can have all kinds of extraordinary experiences. I mean, for a lot of people, and it may be true for most of us at this stage of human development, not really individually prepared for the kind of work required by one monogamous connection, that Paul is the path to gather information about who we are from various types of dynamics, to explore different portals, how different connections bring out different parts of us is beautiful, magnificent. Don't misunderstand me. But if we're wanting to go all the way through to that uncommon bond experience sustainably, that's what I was saying. I don't think we can do it in that form. Can I ask you a question, Neil? Of course. You mentioned earlier, you were talking about this idea that maybe what we need to do is do the groundwork, the shadow work, the working through the material work in order to have a, a more real experience or a more truly sustainable experience of, say, great love, right? Yes. When you ask that question, then I ask the question to myself, you know, where does this sort of thing that just exists between two people? Because when I hear that, I think, well, you can throw any two people into an elevator, and if they both have the willingness to do the work, we're, we're assuming that they can go to that place. And I'm not sure that's true, because I do think there has to be something that exists between the two people. And I always ask myself, what is that thing that needs to exist between the two people? Um, because it can't just be any two people. At least it's my experience it can't be. And what I came up with when I was writing uh, Uncommon Bond was fascination, or what you may call curiosity. That with some people, you just have this intrinsic fascination about the other. So let me read you a quote. I just would, I'm interested to hear what your experience of this is. You can connect from all kinds of places, energetic harmony, sexual alchemy, intellectual alignment, but they won't sustain love over a lifetime. You need a thread that goes deeper, that moves below and beyond the shifting sands of compatibility. That thread is fascination, a genuine fascination with someone's inner world, with the way they organize reality, with the way they articulate their feelings with the unfathomable and bottomless depths of their being to hear their soul cry out to you again and again, and to never lose interest in what it is trying to convey. If there is that, then there will still be love when the body sickens, when the sexuality fades, when the perfection projection is long shattered. If there is that you will swim in love's waters until the very last breath. So that's from an uncommon bond. How do you feel about that? Does that feel true? Or do you feel as though a sustaining fascination with another inner, inner world for a lifetime is unrealistic? Um, well, I remember reading that and 
and actually doing the translation, the way I translated that was curiosity. Um, or, and now that I think about it even more, it's like um, the word that comes to me is willingness. That, and, and part of that maybe involves the will because sometimes it is an act of will to bring yourself back and to remind yourself like, there's a reason that I'm here. Um, but I, what I also like about willing is that it implies for me some vulnerability um, and, uh, and openness. Um, and that to me leads to the curiosity. So it may be that, and I'm just, this is just what's coming to me right here in this moment. Um, I think it's true though, especially that, um, that you'll do a different dance at different times. You know, you're not going to do, you're not going to tango from now until the end of time. Although if you're Sue Johnson, maybe you will do that because she's really into the tango. But, but I think that you are, um, there are moments where you are in your sexual realm together. There are moments where you're in your, your emotional realm. There are moments when you're in your intellectual realm. There are moments when all of those things intertwine. And, and yes, there are moments that will challenge us around illness or, you know, if not between like in you or in your partner, it could be in a loved one or, or the way that, um, what's unfolding in the world affects us. Um, things, things that require us to be called back to, um, oh, wow, yeah, there's something even deeper than that that, that springs up for me. And, and, you know, people who, you've been listening to the show for a while, then you know I'm kind of a mystical guy. So I'm, I'm really glad we're having this conversation, Jeff, because it allows me to go there. But, but Neil, let me ask this. I yeah. guess what I'm asking is, Apart from the safe container, apart from my view that to go to all the way to that most expensive thing monogamy is required, which many people won't agree with. Um, I'm, I'm already re ready to receive the emails of disagreement, <laughs> but but and that's fine. I'm open to that. But um, but apart from all of those things that we put in place to hold it safe, so we can do the work, whether it's in monogamous or in polyamorous, whatever it is, um, does there have to be some fundamental spark? or some uh, soul essential feeling, forget love at first sight because it doesn't have, have to happen in that moment, but does something have to exist, some kind of an energetic or cellular or karmic or cosmic charge that just something that pulls two people together that they feel like they're meant specifically to be doing this hard ass work together. So I think I missed your question initially, which was kind of like, not, you just just take, right, right. not just people in an elevator, not just people in an elevator who make all these agreements, but they're like, they don't have that thing. Or does that thing not really matter if you do this work with any other person? I mean, what about chemistry or what I call karmistry or chemistry? I mean, it's schmaltzy languaging, but, but what about that piece? Where is that piece in all of it? Yeah, well, then the question comes up for me, like what led those two people to be in the elevator at the same time at, in uh, that moment? And, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm, my answer is one of them works on the 11th floor and one of them works on the 8th floor. Um, <laughs> but anyway. Exactly, I mean, and, what led, and what led to that, and what led to that. You know, okay. that's where my, you know, I, I get my mind blown on occasion when I think about yeah. how circumstances lead to where we exist. But what about um, attraction, Neil? I mean, apart, so clearly they're on the elevator. I'll go with you. They're on the elevator together for some reason. It was all destined. It was encoded. It's all fine. That doesn't mean they're supposed to be intimate partners. So where does attraction, what is, where does agreed. organic attraction fit into all of it? And where does attraction come from, in fact? Yeah. Um, That's a whole other show. I'm sure. It is. In fact, I was just thinking, wow, we just had our 100th episode with John Gottman and Sue Johnson was totally focused on attraction. And even their take on attraction was just their take on attraction. Um, yeah, I. OK, so I harbor the thought that it's possible that if two random people on an elevator really opened their hearts that they might experience the attraction or the spark that I think is necessary 
for it to lead to this, like to create the energy that sends two people off in this direction. You know, they were, they were, they had one trajectory or they each had their own trajectory and it takes like a little extra energy coming into the system to send their trajectories um, off in, in parallel or intertwined directions. So, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's necessary. Um, and at the same time, there are people who are convinced that they've lost the spark with a partner and rediscover it. Um, and how different is that from two people who just aren't open to the spark with each other, but they could be, I'm not sure, you know, I'd love to do that study. <laughs> you, have a, you have a powerful mind, Mr. Satin. Um, it's a, they're all good. These are all good questions. You know, I mean, I mean, to me, you know, the important thing is that we keep the inquiry open at this stage. I don't think most of us know much of anything and I might include myself in that. But, you know, these are the right questions to ask. You know, what what is the basis for attraction? What are we moving from? Is it just societal conditioning? Is there something karmic and internal that really knows this is one of the beings we're here to encounter? And then the next question, is this somebody who we're supposed to do a short amount of work with for a period of time as part of the journey? Or is this the person we're supposed to do decades and decades of work with? And how do we distinguish the two? Yeah. How do we? Do you have a thought on that? Uh, I have all kinds of thoughts on it, but I don't have a definitive answer. Um, I mean, I do think there's something to be said for a knowing. Um, and uh, we have to be careful. We have to have gone through enough in our own experiences to know the difference between a, um, a sort of an immature knowing and one that's really a seasoned knowing, like an informed innocence rather than just a naive innocence. And you know, I think you do enough work and you've had enough experiences and you've learned enough lessons and been through enough disappointments that you do reach a stage where it's clearer and clearer, you know, where it's sustainable and where it just, you know, for me, when I had the initiating uncommon bond experience, I couldn't imagine. It was unbearable to imagine that that was only there for a short period of time. Impossible. I was the, I couldn't even hold that in my consciousness for more than an instant. It was too painful. And it didn't make an ounce of sense to me because based on my experience, my limited experience with crack open love and my societal conditioning, if you had that kind of experience, of course you're supposed to marry and have children together. It's the only possibility that made any sense. Now, having been down the road a little longer and written a book about these processes, I can very safely and clearly say that I was absolutely not supposed to spend my life with her. No way. No how. Not possible. That's not what that was about. And but you only know that by living. Hmm. Yeah. And I love how you address that in the book too. the, the rush to like how, okay, now it's like, now we're, it's marriage and then it's babies. And yeah. it's like, there's something in us that wants to, I don't know what that is. I think you say control. It's like about controlling that experience to, to make it well, last. It, well, it's, it is. And it's also, um, not, being trained to know what to do with that amount of feeling. So you, it, it wants to move somewhere. It wants to express itself in other forms. And some people make the mistake of thinking that form has to be marriage and family life, which is not always true for every dynamic. Mm. And yeah, uh, because we, when that feeling comes and you haven't had an experience, an uncommon bond experience, very few people have had that experience. It's uh, it's all you can do to figure out where to, where to send that energy because it's, we well, are just not trained in the art of holding it. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, uh, one passage that I actually dog-eared in my book that I wanted to read. Um, cause I think it speaks to what we're talking about, which is, um, may I? Yeah. Of course. So quoting Jeff Brown, um, you don't measure love in time. You measure love in transformation. Sometimes the longest connections yield very little growth while the briefest of encounters change everything. Maybe two people in an elevator. That's not in the book. Um, the heart doesn't wear a watch. It's timeless. It doesn't care how long you know someone. It doesn't care if you had a 40-year anniversary, if there is no juice in the connection. What the heart cares about is resonance, resonance that opens it, resonance that enlivens it, resonance that calls it home. And when it finds it, the transformation begins. Some guy made that into a song. He had a singer sing that. I, 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 I love the song version of that piece. Um, and um, how do you feel about that piece? 
I hate it. No, just kidding. Um, the, hey, I, I hate it a little too sometimes. <laughs> well, um, you know, it's it has that, you know, that's, there's the potential, right, of just being like, oh, you know, it wasn't meant to be, or this is like, this is the silver lining talking, like, you know, where I'm going to, I'm just going to say this, I, I had to grow from this and it was only meant to be whatever. And, you know, I spoke those words a lot when Chloe and I were going through our breakup, breakups, I should say, because it happened several times. Um, you know, I guess this is what was meant to be. And I guess this is what I was supposed to learn. But on a deeper level, the way that that speaks to me is really about, is less about the, the time element of it and more about the resonance, the way that it brings our attention to how do we foster resonance. Um, that's, I think, so key to the longevity of a connection is your ability to foster it. And I think that is through what we were talking about at the very beginning, which is how do you embrace your embodiment? How do you bring yourself right back into your body in the way that it and and your partner's bodies and experiences um, vibrate in resonance with each other and where they don't? And how do you address that with each other? And, and the absolute necessity of it. I mean, if you're just going to do the transcendence bypass together, you're going to be crashing down to earth pretty hard and harsh, right? You absolutely have to bring everything back into the body. And we know what happens when we open the lines in the body. You don't have to do a bioenergetic session with Al Lowen to know that it's going to bring everything up that's held within the container. Um, and, you know, this is this is the work right here, and you're doing this work, and this is the work that, you know, John Wellwood's been writing about, Stephen and Andrea Levine have been writing about for years, Gay, Gay and Kathleen Hendricks or Catherine Hendricks have been writing about for years, which is what we do when we come back down to earth, and how willing are we to do the work to get back into our bodies and deal with what lives inside of us. And, you know, uh, at this stage of human development, resonance is I mean we need resonance in order to be feel the energy or the willingness or the hopefulness to go back into the shadow and do the work and hope that there's something in that connection that will still be there or even more deeply there later but we need more than anything our models and blueprints for what relational consciousness looks like and how we deepen it and how we sustain it and what has to be cleared through this is the work of our lives and I'm fairly, fairly convinced that if we keep focusing on individual path, whether it's economically as an economic accumulator or master of the economic realm or spiritually, you know, individual practice and the meditation as the road to God, that we are going to take ourselves farther and farther in the direction of a destroying this planet because we're not aware of anything horizontally outside of ourselves. Um, and we're not going to know this realm of possibilities that exist between us the profound realms of possibility that exist between us. We have to develop blueprints for doing this shadow work and for knowing what embodied presence feels like and knowing how to hold to it and sustain it without running away from one, each other in, in dynamics. And that's the work right now that has to be developed. Hmm. Um, one thing I loved about An Uncommon Bond was how it transformed from something that was really frustrating me into, into a healing journey. And, um, and so much in the, you know, the middle towards the end part of the book is about the healing path and yeah. how important that is. Because um, Lowen had a choice, as did the author who was inspired to write the book. Either go back to armor and see the ending of the connection as more evidence of how impossible love is in this world. And God knows we all had experience experiences that would fortify or support support that belief or and I remember the moment of my own experience when I had to decide am I going to walk away from this and close down and just stay shut down for good or am I going to somehow find a way to walk right into that web of pain and try to find my way to love that experience forward in some other way in my life and that's the moment of decision we make as individuals in a breakup and that's the moment of decision we make in a dynamic when the connection gets difficult. Yeah, and for you, where did you find the courage to make that choice? You know, you know, it just didn't make sense to me, Neil, that that and I guess I'm just not cynical enough or you know, something. I just didn't make sense to me that this experience could have all which seems so on so many levels, things happened that I can't it didn't even put in the book 
that any nor- normal person in the world would think that I'm insane to describe them. It's true. Things happened that were radical. It was like we entered another realm and all kinds of things happened that never happened otherwise. And it just didn't make sense to me that all of that could have happened just for me to spend my life suffering. There mm. had to be some positive reason for this. And, you know, I had beautiful grandparents who kept bringing me back to the light in my life, despite my difficult and challenging parents. And they had something to do with that. I, I had enough of an experience with the light to know that there was some possibility that this was intended to take me to the light in a way that I could not possibly for, foresee in the heart of the darkness. I just believed it. I leaned towards that maybe 53% versus 47 in the other direction. That was enough. Mm, yeah. We're, the word that I didn't speak when I was misanswering your question before was um, was there's a lot of faith and you could call it belief yeah. or you could call it faith, but yeah. um, I had great faith and I have great faith in humanity. And I always, you know, despite Donald Trump, I still have great faith in humanity. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, I'm wondering if you can just tell us a little bit about what you're working on now and how people can find you and find yeah. more out about you. Uh, I'm, I'm writing a, a, probably my last long book, uh, um, a book about spirituality where I, challenge through my own journey um, ungrounded spiritualities things that we've talked about a bit here and I make an effort to try to craft a model or a framework a more relational inclusive grounded framework going forward so I'm hoping to have that book out in fall of 18 um, I'm continuing to publish other author, authors through in realman press you can see our our book set in realman.com we just published uh, andrew harvey and chris sade's book evolutionary love relationships which i think you would love um yeah he was on the show to talk about it actually oh he was okay yes. great um and i'm teaching at soul shaping institute i'm going to develop that quite a bit more after the book is done and um and they can find me at soulshaping.com as my main website or on my my fan page on facebook Great. And I'm reminded, too, of your your movie that you did, um, which yes. I haven't seen yet. I watched the, a, f- a few trailers and excerpts from it. It looks like it's fascinating, but it's about this question of spirituality. Um, what, and Yeah. And what is it really that is the question and it weaves the personal into it as the movie proceeds. It's a it's a very intense watch. Definitely wear a tinfoil hat while watching. Um, but it does, it does endeavor to speak to, through the journey, this question of what is real spirituality, grounded spirituality, and what is dissociative spirituality. I mean, I, that's really at the heart of the film. Well, Jeff Brown, thank you so much for your time today. And I feel like we could easily just talk for another hour, um, which I'd love to do. But I know that you have commitments and, and I have commitments too. But that being said, I hope that we can chat again uh, for the podcast. And... Um, if uh, if anything has come up for you listening, um, reach out. Um, you can get in touch with Jeff through his website. You can always reach me, uh, Neilius, N-E-I-L-I-U-S, at neilsatin.com. And if you want the show guide that summarizes this conversation and as long, uh, along with takeaways, you again can visit neilsatin.com slash soulshaping or uh, text the word PASSION to the number 33444. Follow the instructions and we'll get the show guide to you. Uh, Thanks again, Jeff. Thanks, Neil. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word PASSION, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.